and happy birthday to Jesus. Uh, if you're new here, join the crowd. I'm new too. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here, but I'm brand new, okay? And so hope you guys will come back in a few weeks when we start gathering again on Sundays on January the 7th. Uh, come join with us and worship King Jesus with us. We would love to have you join us as we start this new year. Listen, only Jesus gets a global birthday party, all right? And we are here for it tonight, the global birthday party of King Jesus. We're glad that you're here to celebrate it with us. Uh, if you're a guest tonight, you are especially welcome. We're glad all the regulars are here too, but if you're a guest, we're really glad that you are here. Thanks for coming. You know, parents, uh, Jesus was probably pretty good in church, okay? No pressure tonight. No, seriously, if your kids aren't good in church tonight, that's totally fine. No big deal. We are glad that you are here with us to celebrate with us. Please don't feel like you need to leave, uh, need to leave uh, no matter what the sound is, okay? We're just glad that you are here. Uh, what we celebrate tonight is astounding, and we should drop our jaws each year when we think about the incomprehensibility of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. There are at least three kinds of responses, I think, to the historical emergence of Jesus as it's relayed to us in the scriptures. Some were threatened by Jesus, some were indifferent to Jesus, and then some worshiped Jesus. Threatened, indifferent, and then some worshipped. I bet those three responses are represented in this room tonight. See if you can nail down which category you land in tonight. Threatened, indifferent, or worshipping Jesus. First, let's look at some feeling threatened by the authority of the baby king. Some feel threatened by Jesus' authority. Now, why would anyone feel threatened by the birth of a baby born more than 2,000 years ago? Well, if we look back at that first Christmas, we can see why. At the time, a guy named Herod was king, and he was laser-focused on finding out the identity of this rumored baby king that he'd heard of. Herod knew that a movement of the people in that area was uh, being generated to crown this baby the next king. It was a threat to his power, and he was a very paranoid ruler. We know this because history tells us that he had 10 wives and a whole bunch of kids with those 10 wives. And he had a bunch of those wives and kids killed because he was paranoid that they were going to end up swiping the throne from him. It was said of Herod in that day, in the day of Jesus, that it was safer to be his pig than it was to be his son. He was a paranoid ruler. So this response, looking for the threat of this baby king and to wipe him out, this is not out of keeping of his character at all. The birth of the rumored king threatened his control as king. And so he had to put an end to this threat. Some of us are afraid too, I think, of this little boy if we really think about what his identity truly is. And we're afraid of him for some of the very same reasons. We instinctively know that if this child, if this baby boy really was God in the flesh, then we owe him some sort of allegiance ourselves, just like Herod was afraid of owing. Some of us are here tonight probably a little bit more like Herod than we realize, probably not with murderous hearts, but this idea of Jesus being our king, our master with rights over us, every last part of us. Now, that is a threatening idea for us as red-blooded Americans. We're afraid of losing autonomy. If Jesus has a say in all that we do, well, then he has a say in what we spend our money on. He has a say in what we watch on our screens. He has, an, he has a say on how we spend our Sundays, right? We're afraid of our lives crumbling underneath the rule of Jesus. When it gets down to it, we really just all kind of want to do our thing without God interfering with our choices. Everyone, every last one of us here is born this way. We are born wanting our own way and not God's way. But the Bible tells us that as our creator, Jesus knows better than us what is best for us. He knows what makes humanity tick. He knows what makes us flourish as human beings. So it is actually in your best interest and in my best interest to submit to the authority of this baby boy, of King Jesus. If you have questions about these kinds of statements, if these kinds of ideas are new to you, 
Please track me down afterwards. Afterwards, I would love to speak with you about any of these claims. I believe them to be true and the best thing for you to believe and trust for the rest of your days. So one response to that first Christmas baby is to feel threatened by his authority. Maybe some of us aren't in a spirit of outright rejection tonight, though. Maybe some of us are intrigued, but ultimately indifferent about the birth of a baby king. When Herod caught wind that his throne may be in jeopardy, he called the brightest minds of the Middle East in to counsel him. And he asked them what they believed, uh, this, who they believed this king to be, and where they believed this king was going to be born. We read this in Matthew chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he, Herod, inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And these guys, they do not even skip a beat. They had studied the scriptures. They knew them well. They knew them front to back and back to front. They knew the answers. And they told him, continuing in Matthew 2, they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophets. And here's what the prophet said. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So right there, if you're not familiar with the Christian Bible, they are quoting a prophecy in the scriptures that was written 700 years before the birth of Jesus about the location of Jesus's birth. Can you imagine like somebody back in the 1300s predicting that the Philadelphia Eagles would definitely stomp the New York Giants tomorrow night at this very time? If you heard that prophecy, you would believe them because tomorrow night at this time, you will find out that they would have been right. But this is essentially what's taking place here in this text. The biblical prophecy 700 years before the birth of Jesus comes true 700 years later in the birth of Jesus in the place of Bethlehem, just like the scriptures prophesied. But these scribes and priests, even though they had some understanding of the truth, were ultimately eh, unmoved, nonplussed by what they saw. They, they had this idea of the truth, a kernel of it, but they never actually put right foot in front of the left, right foot in front of the left, and pursued the truth. They never spent any energy trying to verify the claims that the scriptures make about the identity of Jesus. These guys were not even willing to walk the five miles from Herod's palace to the place of Jesus' birth to see if the prophecy was true. So close and yet so far. But I wonder if this is true of any of us in here tonight. Even if you claim to be a Christian, have you sort of just kind of stumbled into it because that's what your family has always done or believed? Or maybe just go to church because it's a good idea for your kids to be exposed to that, right? I wonder tonight if you've been inoculated with just enough morality, just enough goodness in your life, just enough religion to keep you from actually exploring the true identity of Jesus and his claims over your life. I heard one guy say, his name, his name is Tim Keller. He said, people who actually saw and heard Jesus never reacted indifferently. Either they were scared of him or furious with him, or they knelt down and worshiped him. But nobody simply liked him. Nobody said, he's so inspiring. He makes me want to live a better life. Jesus didn't do that to anyone. He didn't make anyone feel like that, I should say. C.S. Lewis, maybe a name you've heard, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He famously said that Jesus was either a lunatic who believed himself to be somebody who he wasn't, a liar who had a golden tongue and was able to deceive a whole bunch of people into believing he was someone he wasn't, or he was the Lord. Lunatic, liar, or Lord. In other words, in the Lord option, he was who he said he was. The God of the universe come in the flesh. Tonight is as good a time as any for you to try to figure out who you think Jesus truly was. Was he a lunatic? Was he a liar? Or is he the living, resurrected Lord of glory? You cannot be indifferent to Jesus' claims like these scribes were with Herod. He either, he either is who he says he is or he isn't. If you've got questions about that, again, please bring your questions. I'd be happy 
to grab coffee with you sometime in the new year. It will be like black coffee because we are starting Whole30 on January 1st or 2nd. I'm not sure which yet. I'm not committed yet, but it, black coffee. But I'd be happy to share some black coffee with you, cream and sugar for you if you want. Anyway, when I celebrate the holidays with my family, usually this is like a custom with my in-laws. When we celebrate uh, the holidays together, there is this dangerous bag that sits on the counter during uh, the whole extent of the holidays. It is orange. It is five pounds, it is ziplocked, and it is filled with peanut butter M&Ms. Not the useless peanut M&Ms, not the yellow bag. Yellow bag is nonsense. You got to get you that orange bag, okay? Glorious, heavenly, addictive peanut butter M&Ms. I mean, I am telling you, you cannot have just one bag of those things. <laughs> And often one of those orange bags is going to lay around, like I said, during the holidays. By the time two o'clock rolls around on Christmas Day, like it will tomorrow, you're ready for a pick-me-up. But there's this one problem. Once you pop, you can't stop on these things, right? And so by the time you roll up to the dinner table three hours later with that gross, uh, full, but still kind of hungry feeling that you have in your stomach after you've eaten too much sugar in the middle of the day, because you've eaten 947 peanut butter M&Ms, you don't even feel like eating, even though you know you should, and you know that you need to, and it would be good for you. But I, I wonder if that's the way some of your souls feel tonight. You've eaten from the religion table, you've eaten from the church table or from the morality table. Maybe you've eaten from the, the pay it forward table, glad to give back when it makes financial sense for you. You feel full in some sense, uh, but also kind of not. Like after a day of eating M&Ms and then sliding up to the dinner table. I wonder if it's because you have not sunk your teeth deeply into the soul satisfying bread of life that is Jesus Christ. Neil Postman was a sociologist who wrote one of the most penetrating books I think of our generation. He was not a Christian, uh, but the book he wrote was called amusing ourselves to death. He wrote this way back in 1985, way before Netflix and, and social media. He said this, Americans no longer talk to each other. They entertain each other. They do not exchange ideas. They exchange images. They do not argue with propositions. They argue with good looks, celebrities, and commercials. The result is that we are a people on the verge of amusing ourselves to death. He's right. We are on the verge of numbing ourselves with amusement all the way into a Jesusless eternity because we are obsessed with the here and with the now. So we fill up with Netflix. We fill up with Twitter and Facebook and Insta or whatever it is for you. And there's not much room left in our spiritual stomachs for the eternally significant. So we become numb and indifferent to Jesus. Maybe intrigued a few times a year, Christmas and Easter, but ultimately, meh. But listen, that baby boy would not stay a baby boy. That baby boy would grow up and claim to be bread for the entire world. A spiritual, soul-satisfying bread, the last bread that you would ever need. Can I encourage you to take a few minutes during your 2023 Christmas season to explore the actual claims of Jesus, to transform your intrigue and eh, indifference into a pursuit of the truth about Jesus. Tonight, some of us feel threatened. You don't want Jesus or anyone else prioritizing your life for you. Or maybe the second category is that you've been half intrigued by the idea of Jesus, but ultimately unmoved indifference, not really willing to explore the claims of the Christian Bible. But like I mentioned from the outset, there's a third category for us to explore tonight. And it's the one that I hope we all, all funnel down into by the end of our time together tonight. Lastly, some worship at the arrival of the baby king. At the time of Jesus' birth, there was this astrological phenomenon. A new star appeared that had never been observed before. 
And this triggered a group of experts 800 miles away from where Jesus was to be born. Matthew chapter 2 calls them magi. These are the guys we have traditionally referred to as the wise men. One day, this new star suddenly appeared in the West, and they're wondering to themselves, is this, is this a comet? Is it a nova? And so they researched, and then they convened, and then they compared notes and compared ideas and came up with a plan to get a closer look. They would have had to organize supplies, camels, guards, servants. This would not be a simple and swift expedition for them to go explore these claims. But what's interesting to know is that they weren't just excited about a scientific discovery, like a new star. The text says in Matthew 2, verse 2, that these men desired to worship the one who the uh, star pointed to. And the text tells us, Matthew tells us, that when they arrived in Bethlehem, the star somehow, we don't know how, it somehow identified the house that the Messiah was staying in. And when they went into the house, here's what Matthew chapter 2, verse 11 says. They saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped him. The wisest, most educated, wealthiest men of their time prostrated themselves on the dusty ground and gave their allegiance to the baby king. I mean, it was like the elite of the elite of their day on their face before God in the flesh, Jesus. Their worship only made sense because the first Christmas had a direct line to the first Easter 30 years later. It's been said that if we don't connect the manger to the cross, we will forever have a mere baby Christianity. If we don't connect the manger to the cross, we will have a baby Christianity. So tonight, press into the fact that this boy became a man who showed his love for us and that while we were still sinners, he died for us. This Christmas, join the Magi in worship. As we close here, I wonder if some of us came in a little exhausted from this Christmas season, feeling kind of full, excited, but also a little bit hollow, a little empty. It's because in reality, you're actually hungry. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. This is so true for every single one of us in here tonight. You were made for another world, not just this one. As beautiful as it is and as broken as it is, you were made for another world. This Christmas story bears its teeth in the face of the American dream and proclaims a central, bold truth. You alone are not enough. You are not enough. But here's the good news. Because of Jesus, it's okay that you are not enough in and of yourself. Because God had to come in human form to make us whole, to make us enough, something we could never do for ourselves. So this Christmas, stop thinking that 2024 is going to be the year where you muster it up and get it all together, where you're going to do like whole 30 or whole 365 or whatever. It's not going to happen. You are never going to be enough. Stop thinking that with a few New Year's resolutions, you're going to get on the right track. Ultimately, you won't, and neither will I. We can pretend all we want, but what I want you to hear tonight, more than anything, is that it's okay to not be okay. Because Christmas came. Because hope came came. It is okay that you are not okay because Jesus came to live in our place, to die for our sin, and then to rise up in victory over the grave. That makes it okay that you are not okay. So 700 years before Jesus' birth, here's how the prophet Jeremiah described what Jesus would come to do and who he had come to be. Jeremiah 33, 700 years before Jesus. The day will come, says the Lord, when I will do for Israel and Judah all the good things I have promised them. In those days and at that time, I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line, and he will do what is just and right throughout the land. 
In that day, my people will be saved and they will live in peace. And this will be the name for where my people will dwell. The Lord is our righteousness. Okay, all good and well. What do those ancient words that you just read have to do with you and me in 2023? It simply means this for you. Jesus Christ, who's coming, we announce in this season, is our righteousness. That means he is righteous in your place and he is righteous in my place. In Christ, we are made right with God. But the inverse is true too, right? Without Christ, we are not right with God. If you'd like to hear how this Jesus can rescue you from your sin, please talk with someone on your row tonight or come snag me afterwards or shoot us an email or a text. I'd be glad to talk. But listen, God might have become little on that first Christmas morning, but he had huge plans. The Christ child's first soft whimper was God's war cry against the enemy, launching a global campaign to redeem all that is wrong with our world. This Christmas, afresh, with new eyes, wonder and worship at God become man. You are not enough, and that is okay. It's okay to not be okay. Jesus is enough for you. Don't reject him. Don't shrug at him. Worship him. Will you pray with me? God, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Spirit, thank you for helping us see Jesus in the scriptures. And then Jesus, what what can we even say? You were born with the purpose of dying. All of us in here are going to die, but none of us were born with the purpose of dying. And we thank you that you came and you were unflappable and unshakable in that purpose. You were all anguish that we might be all joy. You were cast off that we might be brought in. You were treated as an enemy that we might be treated as friends. You were stripped that we might be clothed. You were wounded that we might be healed. You entered darkness so that we could enjoy light. You wept tears so that in the end, all of ours can be dried. You entered the grave that we might gain victory over the grave. Oh, we come and adore you, Emmanuel, Christ our Lord. To you be all glory given. Amen.